Joy One. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and John Russell. Later, Katie Weaver and Ashley will bring us the next part in our series on America's national parks. But first, France joined the United States on Thursday in support of easing patent protections on COVID-19 vaccines. The action could help poor countries get more shots and quicken the end of the pandemic. On Wednesday, the U.S. government changed its own position and supported removing the protections. It brought cheers from health activists and complaints from drug companies. During a visit to a vaccine center on Thursday. French President Emmanuel Macron added, "I completely favor this opening up of the intellectual property." Despite his support for removing protections, Macron also said it would not solve the problem of getting more vaccines to more people around the world. He noted that places like Africa were not equipped to make COVID-19 vaccines. He said, "Vaccine donation should be most important." While the backing from two countries with big drug-making companies is important, many problems remain to be solved. The idea of removing patent protections was first floated by India and South Africa in October. Some eighty countries, mostly developing nations. Have supported the Indian and South African idea, an official who was not permitted to give his name said. However, if one country in the World Trade Organization votes against the plan, it will block efforts to make the change. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison called the U.S. announcement great news. But did not answer a question about whether his country would make the same decision. South Korean officials said they were also watching the Biden announcement, but did not say they would do the same. Russian President Vladimir Putin said his country would support it. The drug industry says that a faster answer to the lack of vaccines in some parts of the world would be for rich countries to start sharing their vaccine supply with poorer countries. The industry argues that production of coronavirus vaccines is difficult and cannot be increased by easing intellectual property protections. Instead, it says that reducing problems in supply chains. As well as the lack of vaccine ingredients, are the most important problems right now. A waiver is the simple but the wrong answer to what is a complex problem," said the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. The organization added that the idea will not increase production nor provide practical solutions. To the health crisis, intellectual property expert Sham Balganesh is a professor at Columbia Law School. He said a WTO waiver could help, but it would only go so far because of other problems in the manufacturing and shipping of vaccines.
Rhino poaching is rising again in South Africa. Wildlife parks say that poaching has increased since the government eased pandemic restrictions. Limits on international travel had the benefit of keeping poachers away. In 2020, 394 rhinos were poached, 30% fewer than 2019, and the fewest since 2011. In November, South Africa began easing international travel restrictions. Joe Shaw is the Africa Rhino Lead for the World Wildlife Fund International Network. She said that since November and December of last year, there has been a serious increase in the number of poachings, especially at Kruger National Park. The park is located in northeast South Africa and is one of the largest wildlife reserves on the continent. She did not say how many total poachings had happened this year. There is a very real threat as poaching pressure has increased since lockdown, perhaps to meet the demand from the international markets, she said. The WWF says rhinos are poached for their horns. The horn is used in many Asian traditional medicines. The horn is also a sign of wealth. Rhino poaching often involves both local poachers and international crime groups. Poachers smuggle the highly priced horns across borders, often to Asia. Rhinos are sometimes shot with a tranquilizer gun before their horns are cut off, Save the Rhino said on its website. The animal is then left to bleed to death. Julian Rademeyer works to fight organized crime in Africa at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. He said other rhinos are killed with high-powered hunting rifles. Because of the pandemic, nature reserves have had fewer visitors than usual. Budget cuts have forced reserves to shrink their anti-poaching security operations. But some reserves are taking the step to keep poachers away by safely dehorning rhinos. Veterinarians cut the horn at the base rather than removing it all, which prevents the rhino from bleeding to death. One nature reserve in Kruger National Park has dehorned 100 rhinos since April 2019. Francis Craigie is the head of enforcement at South Africa's Environmental Ministry. He says there are about 16,000 rhinos living in the country. The ministry is expected to release the South Africa's 2021 half-year poaching numbers at the end of June. Poaching and droughts in the northeast region of South Africa have badly hurt the rhino population. In Kruger National Park, the number of rhinos has gone down by more than two-thirds in the past 10 years. A South African National Parks report showed that in 2008, there were 11,800 rhinos. In 2019, there were just 3,800 left. I'm Katie Weaver. The world's glaciers are melting quickly. Scientists from the magazine Nature looked at 20 years of satellite data of the world's 220,000 mountain glaciers. They found that since 2015, glaciers have lost 298 billion metric tons of ice and snow per year. 
That is 31% more than 15 years ago and enough ice melt to put Switzerland under 7.2 meters of water each year. Scientists say the melting is caused by climate change. They have long warned that warming temperatures are shrinking glaciers around the world. Roma Ugone studies glaciers at ETH Zurich and the University of Toulouse in France. He led the report. The thinning rate of glaciers is twice as high as it was 20 years ago, and that's enormous, he said. Half of the world's glacier melt is in the United States and Canada. Alaska's melt rates are among the highest on the planet, Ugane said. Alaska's Columbia Glacier is losing about 35 meters a year, he added. Almost all of the world's glaciers are melting. Even glaciers that used to be solid are now melting, such as ones in Tibet. The melting mirrors the worldwide increase in temperature and is from the burning of coal, oil, and gas, Ugane said. Some smaller glaciers are totally lost. Two years ago, scientists, activists, and government officials in Iceland even held a funeral for a small glacier. The study is the first to use satellite images to examine all of Earth's glaciers that are not connected to ice sheets in Greenland or the Antarctic. Past studies looked at just a small number of the world's glaciers. Shrinking glaciers are a problem for millions of people who use regular glacial melt for drinking water. Very fast melting can also cause deadly floods in places like India, Ugane said. But the biggest threat to the world is rising sea levels. The world's oceans are already rising from climate change because water expands when it gets warmer. Glaciers are responsible for 21% of sea level rise. Melting ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica also cause sea level rise, but to a lesser amount. Mark Sorez is director of the American National Snow and Ice Data Center in Colorado. He thinks sea level rise is going to be a bigger and bigger problem as we move through the 21st century. The NSIDC was not involved in the study. Scientists said that it could take tens or even hundreds of years to regrow melted glaciers. Twyla Moon studies glaciers at the NSIDC. She is not confident the glaciers can regrow, even if there is a worldwide reduction in emissions and the planet's temperature is controlled. We're at a point where we're trying to keep as much ice as possible and slow that rate of loss, she said. I'm Brian Lynn. Many countries around the world will celebrate Mother's Day on May 9th. In celebration of the holiday, we will explore what a Mother's Day poem can teach you about English grammar. You will learn about the imperative mood, a way that English speakers form commands or instructions. 
you will also learn about negative statements. Let's begin our report with a few important terms and ideas. In English, verbs have different moods. Mood means the speaker's purpose or reason for saying something. It is separate from a verb's tense or place in time, past, present, and so on. There is the indicative mood, when a speaker makes a statement that expresses an idea or fact. Here is an example. My name is John. Notice that the subject of the sentence is my name. English has an imperative mood. When a speaker makes a statement that gives an order, command, or instruction, such sentences generally do not have subjects. Here is an example. Finish your homework before you go to bed. Notice that this statement suggests a subject, you, but it is missing. Another important word, will, is missing also. The imperative mood does not really have a tense. When you remove the word will, you remove what marks the verb's tense. In the book Doing Grammar, Max Morenberg notes that an imperative is the only English sentence whose main verb is infinitive. Let's explore imperatives a bit more in a poem by Bruce Lansky. It is called On Mother's Day. Lansky begins his poem with the following words. On Mother's Day, it isn't smart to give your mom a broken heart. So here are things you shouldn't say to dear old mom on Mother's Day. From these lines, you can tell that Lansky is going to use the imperative mood to give a group of instructions. Lansky writes the following. Don't tell her that you'll never eat a carrot, celery, bean, or beet. Don't tell her you think smoking's cool. Don't tell her you've dropped out of school. Notice that Lansky uses the negative form of the imperative three times with the words, don't tell her. How did Lansky arrive at these exact words? Here is the process by which English speakers make the negative form of the imperative. You begin with a full statement, such as, You will not tell her you think smoking is cool. Then you take out the words, you will. Add the word do before not, as in, Do not tell her you think smoking is cool. Finally, combine the words do and not. Don't tell her you think smoking is cool. For those who hope to write one day, Lansky has a humorous final instruction for Mother's Day. Don't tell her when you're grown you'll be a starving poet, just like me. You can use what you have learned today to form instructions, or negative commands, in many kinds of situations. Any time you need to tell people what to do, think about the imperative mood. But be careful about how you use it. For example, you probably do not want to give too many commands or instructions to your boss, or your mother for that matter. I'll end this report with a sentence that uses the imperative mood. Remember to be kind to your mother on Mother's Day. I'm John Russell. Today, on our National Parks journey, we head to the southeastern state of Kentucky. Here you will find rolling hills and thick green forests. But beneath the land, 
is a strange and silent underground world. One early explorer described it as grand, gloomy, and peculiar. Welcome to Mammoth Cave National Park. Mammoth Cave is the longest known cave system in the world. It is two times as large as the world's second biggest cave system. Its size helped give it its name. Mammoth, as an adjective, means extremely large. Mammoth Cave National Park is in Kentucky's Green River Valley. The park covers over 20,000 hectares. It protects the river valley and hilly land as well as the vast underground cave system. The U.S. Congress formed Mammoth Cave National Park in 1941. Forty years later, it was named a World Heritage Site, and in 1990, it became a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve Site. Researchers and explorers have mapped more than 600 kilometers of passageways in Mammoth Cave, and scientists continue to explore it. Water formed the cave over millions of years. Other than the Green River, few sources of water exist above ground. That is because water seeps quickly into the earth. Soil made of broken-down limestone absorbs the water. This has created a vast and complex system of chambers and passageways. A delicate and unique ecosystem exists inside the cave. More than 100 kinds of animals live in Mammoth Cave. Some of them live their whole lives in total darkness. Cave shrimp and many other kinds of eyeless, colorless species can be found. Mammoth Cave was once home to about 10 million bats. They included species like Indiana bats, big brown bats, little brown bats, and the eastern small-footed bat. Now they number in the thousands. Humans first entered Mammoth Cave about 4,000 years ago. They discovered uses for minerals inside the cave. Researchers describe them as primitive miners. Humans explored Mammoth Cave for nearly 2,000 years. Then their exploration appears to have ended. The caves would not be explored again until the end of the 1700s. Many stories name John Houchins for rediscovering the cave. They say he was hunting in the area when he came upon a black bear. The bear was close to the entrance of the cave. Houchins shot the bear, but he failed to kill it. The bear ran, and Houchins followed. It led him into the cave. Experts do not agree on the exact year of Houchin's discovery, and some people question the story entirely. Slaves played many important roles at Mammoth Cave during the 1800s. During the War of 1812, slaves mined the cave for a mineral called saltpeter. 
It was used to produce ammunition used during battle. And in 1816, slaves began guiding visitors on cave tours. At the time, the cave was still privately owned. One of the greatest early explorers of the cave was a slave named Stephen Bishop. He arrived at Mammoth Cave in 1838 when he was a teenager. He learned the tour paths from white guides. But Bishop wanted to push beyond the cave's toured areas. He set off to explore parts of the cave no human had ever seen. Bishop and a companion sought to cross an area called the Bottomless Pit. Its unknown darkness had stopped people from trying to go beyond it. But fear and darkness did not stop Bishop. The areas he discovered beyond Bottomless Pit are still open to visitors today. Bishop started naming different areas of the cave that he discovered. Fat Man's Misery, Cleveland Avenue, and Mammoth Dome, among others. He was also the first to discover a river running through the cave. Bishop created a map of Mammoth Cave in the early 1840s. It included 16 kilometers of passageways. Most of the passages had been discovered or explored by Bishop himself. His map remained in use for more than 40 years. Bishop gained his freedom in 1856, but he died the next year at the age of 37. His grave lies within Mammoth Cave National Park. It was Bishop who described Mammoth Cave as grand, gloomy, and peculiar. For National Park visitors who venture into the cave today, Bishop's description remains true. About 500,000 people tour the cave each year. They are among more than 2 million visitors to the park itself. Mammoth Cave National Park offers campsites for those who want to sleep under the stars. There is also a hotel in the park. And there are plenty of activities outside of the cave. People ride horses on the more than 100 kilometers of park trails. They also fish and boat in the park's rivers. But the main draw of Mammoth Cave National Park remains the dark mystery of an underground world with so much more to discover. I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.